Welcome to the Christmas GCN Racing News Show. Coming up, the GOAT Matthew van der Poel is back, but he has some serious competition this year in cyclocross. Jeremy is going to be taking you through the main action from the weekend. We're also going to look at how you could get your hands on Wout van Aert's Team Bianchi bike, the new Marmite AG2R kit, more race cancellations for 2021, but in better news, some brand new sponsors entering the sport. This week in the world of racing, we learned that AG2R have a new jersey, but not new shorts. Here it is, if you haven't seen it already. Never before have I seen a new jersey have such an extreme set of opinions on both sides of the fence. Now, my personal first thought was that it looked a bit like a design you'd see on a plastic bag from a budget supermarket, but I'm now going to admit right here, publicly, that it's beginning to grow on me. It's a fairly radical shift away from their design of the last decade or so, but there's no doubt you won't be able to miss the new sponsors, Citroen namely, and you probably won't be able to miss the riders in the peloton either. Partly because they decided to keep those brown shorts. Never any doubt about that, I'm sure. Why change a winning formula? Now, you've been voting over on the GZN app as to whether or not you think this kit is hot or not, and here are the current standings. 50-50, a complete split. Uh, so make sure you head over to the app to have your say if you haven't already done so, and we'll see if things sway either way before tomorrow's GCN show. We also learned this week in racing that Mathieu van der Poel looks beatable, even though he won. Here's Jeremy with all the news from the Namur World Cup from yesterday. Thank you, Dan. Over the weekend, one of the classic cross races of the season went down in the beautiful landscape of Namur, Belgium, at the Citadel, also known as the Castle of Namur. Now, if you haven't heard or seen of this race before, it is one of the most treacherous, crazy tracks on the entire cyclocross scene, and it's been this way since its very first edition in 2009. Now, every year, this event in Namur becomes part of the Christmas period of racing in Belgium, also known as the Cursed Period. Now, this this year was no different with all of the big engines coming out on both the men's and the women's side to throw down in Namur. Now on the women's field, it started fast on the huge steep climb straight out of the start gate and it was immediately led by the Hungarian national champion and under 23 World Cup leader Blanca Katavas of Proximus Alpha Motor Holmes Dulcini. Now after a small bobble or well, we'll call it a crash on one of the many steep descents in the first lap, Denise Betsema of Palisals and Bingle would take over the lead. Now Lucinda Braun of course was not lurking very far away. The queen of cross for the moment of the Telenet Balawasa team took over the lead and to be quite honest, she never really looked back. The world champion, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, would slot up into third place for much of the day, but the win was long gone. Braun would ace the technical sections and ride dominantly on the climbs to ride solo for much of the day. Now, while Braun was off doing her thing, the cameras were focused on a battle behind with the American national champion, Clara Hansinger, the 23-year-old of the Cannondale CycloCrossWorld.com team, who around 20 minutes into the race would ride to connect with the world champion Celine Del Carmen Alvarado and take over third place. A huge career moment for that rider. Denise Betsema, well, she wasn't safe either. And after a little bit of argy-bargy between Hansinger and Betsema, mainly coming from Betsema towards Hansinger, but Hansinger would go on to finish a career best second place after dropping Betsema on the final climb. Oh, it stings. Betsema would round out the podium in third. Hansinger in the post-race interview said that the race came with a lot of pressure after her fourth place in Havre last weekend, but she was following in the ruts of her predecessors. I thought that was a very good answer. It almost seemed scripted, but it was it was really good. Either way, she busted up the Dutch stranglehold on the women's field in Namur, and the American fans, speaking from one here, was very excited about the result. Now, the overall in the Women's World Cup has Braun leading with 80 points, Alvarado with 52, and Betsema with 50 points. In the men's race, it was the showdown of all showdowns. The three arguably biggest talents in the sport of cycling right now, yes, I said it, Tom Pidcock of Trinity Racing, Wout van Aert of Jumbo Visma, and Matthew Vanderpool of Alpes and Fenix, all going head to head in one of the most treacherous, iconic cyclocross races in the world. Let's just say the self-confidence on the start line was not lacking and it did not take long for things to shake out at the front, but it was the World Cup leader, Michael Van Tornhout of Palisals and Bingle, who would take over the lead from the get-go. But within minutes of that first lap going off, 
Tom Pidcock would emerge at the front of the race. Matthew Vanderpoel would go across, as would Van Aert, making it four riders at the front of the race. Quinton Hedemans of the Tormann CX team would also feature at one point in the front group, but did fall off the pace after a couple of laps. Pidcock would ride much of the race in the lead, just off the front of the chasing three. Michael Van Torenhout would suffer a flat tire and lose contact, and with two laps to go, Van Aert would sew the gap back up to Pidcock, but it would be Matthew Vanderpoel who would profit from Van Aert's work and do an insane attack over the top of both of them on the big start climb just before the bell lap. Vanderpoel would ride a flawless last lap. Van Aert would too, but Matthew Vanderpoel would take the win and Pidcock would come in for third place. In the post-race interview, a very humble Wow Van Aert would said that he focused too much on bringing Tom Pitcock back and not enough believing in himself to be able to take the victory. I think it stunned a lot of people watching. He said that it would not make, he would not make that mistake in the coming events that he has on his calendar, but Vanderpoel would go on to make it three races in a row in the Mer last three years, but sat with his hands holding his head at the finish line it was one of the most wattage-packed cross races that we've seen in many years. An epic duel among the kings of the sport right now. And it was one of the best races of the season. If you haven't seen the racing yet, hop on that trainer, plug in the GCN race pass, and go over, watch the race on demand. Of course, territory restrictions do apply, but it was one for the memory books. Now, Michael Van Torenhout continues to hold his lead in the World Cup overall with 62 points, while Van Aert is currently in second place at 55 points, and Tone Ertz and Lars van der Haar are currently tied in third place at 41 points. Whew, that was a serious weekend. It's everything I've got from it. Thank you very much. Back over to you, Dan. Thank you again, Jeremy. Uh, I just think it's great that we now have the prospect of such close racing in the men's events as well as the women's. It just feels like Vanderpool might not have it all his own way this year, but we shall see. Anyway, whilst the rest of us are taking a break over the holidays, Jeremy and Marty will still be hard at it, if you can call commentary hard work. I know it's not for them, as they love it. Uh, but basically, what I'm trying to say is that there is plenty more racing for you to watch over on Race Pass over the next few weeks. Starting on Wednesday with the X2O Badcomers Trophy from Helentaus, which is the next time I see Van Aert and Van Der Poel battling it out head to head. Then, the next round of the Super Prestige is on Saturday, which is Boxing Day. That one is in Zolder in Belgium. And then the third round of the UCI World Cup is the following day in Dendermonde. Uh, that is followed by Horst on the 3rd of January. So as I said, plenty to watch over on Race Pass. Territory restrictions do apply, so please make sure you check the calendar of events where you are. Moving on, you could get your hands on Wout van Aert's Team Bianchi road bike from this year. Uh, so Cervelo will be the new bike sponsors of that team from January the 1st, and so they are auctioning off many of their team bikes from this year. And since it's an auction, they're not going to be cheap, I'm afraid to tell you. And the most expensive bike currently, with still six days remaining on that auction, is the Ultra XR4 that Wout van Aert rode to many prestigious victories this year, including Milan San Remo. That one is currently sitting on nine and a half thousand euros. Uh, whilst the equivalent bike that Primoz Roglic rode the victory at the Vuelta last month, complete with red bar tape, is sitting on seven and a half thousand euros. So in total, there are 28 bikes up for grabs. So grab yourself a, well not a bargain really, but a Bianchi. Uh, the proceeds from those auctions will go back into the team coffers, from what I understand, for 2021. Now incidentally, I had been wondering which cyclocross bike Van Aert would use once his team swapped sponsors on January the 1st. So thank you to those of you who replied on Twitter and informed me that he will continue to ride a Bianchi, only blacked out. The question is, is a Bianchi without any Celeste like Samson without his hair? Uh, thanks too to Stefan Vluert who sent a link to a Vila Flitz article that says Cervelo are busy working on a new cyclocross bike, which I guess is what Van Aert could be riding this time next year. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what that one looks like. Moving on, and unfortunately yet another big race has fallen victim to the coronavirus pandemic. The Tour Colombia has been one of the most spectacular races to watch over the last couple of years, partly down to the star-studded lineup of pros, but mainly because of the absolutely incredibly passionate crowds that have lined the roads. I guess that's probably one of the reasons why the organisers decided to postpone it in 2021, because I'd imagine it'd be very hard to keep those fans away from the race. In better news though, the Vuelta San Juan is set to go ahead in Argentina at the end of January, and that is where Chris Froome will make his debut for his new team, the Israel Startup Nation. The beginning of a very big season, I think, for both him and his new team. 
He will be joined at the Volta San Juan by Peter Sagan of Bora Hansger, who will also start his season there, plus Joao Almeida and probably Oscar Sevilla too. Uh, that one's just an educated guess though. Now last week I talked about Team Scouts looking at younger and younger riders each year and straight after I talked about that, Bora Hansgrohe went and signed a 17 year old for four years. Sian Utzebrooks is a Belgian rider who has been described as the next Remco Evenepoel, who in turn has been seen as the next Eddie Merckx. So that is quite a lot of pressure to put on a 17 year old's shoulders. Uh, he's still going to be a junior next season in fact and will be racing for Team Auto Adair uh, before stepping up to the World Tour as a first year senior in 2022. Now another young rider who many are already keeping a very close eye on is Egan Bernal's younger brother Ronald. Uh, currently only 15 years of age but he is apparently showing a lot of promise and having the name Bernal is certainly going to keep a lot of people's attention on him. However, Cycling News recently spoke to Gianni Savio, who is the manager of course of Androni Giocatli Sidemec, and he said that although he would love to develop Ronald in the same way that he did with Egan, he wouldn't be doing that until at least 18 years of age. That would be very interesting to see just how good he is, won't it? One man though at the other end of his career is the Italian Diego Ulissi of Team UAE Emirates, and he has been forced to take a break both from racing and from training. Health tests revealed an irregular heartbeat and he was then diagnosed with myocarditis, uh, that being an inflammation of the heart muscle. And he's been told that he could need up to six months of complete rest. And that is a horrible situation for any athlete to be in. I'd imagine cycling has been a huge part of his life for at least 20 years now, but of course his health has to come first. On to the news of the new sponsors now, and there are not just one, but two new sponsors for Drop Cycling. Uh, last week we heard that they signed Danny Christmas, and it's going to be Drops Le Col, supported by Tempur, that should be riding for in 2021. Uh, brilliant news for the team, who I know have aspirations of making it to the World Tour eventually, and hats off for attracting sponsorship under such difficult circumstances this year. Now the other new sponsor is for EF Pro Cycling, although I think this has been rumoured for quite some time now, uh, but Nippo will also be a title sponsor of that team in 2021, which would have played its part, I'm sure, in the signing of a couple of their riders over the last few weeks. Now, believe it or not, there haven't been any major signings announced in the last week amongst the big teams. It appears that the transfer market is finally starting to quieten down, just 10 days to go until the new year. However, Christian Knees, the German, has announced his retirement from the sport. Now, he's been a pro rider for 17 years now, the last 10 of which have been with Team Ineos or Team Sky, where he mainly played a crucial support role to Chris Froome at the Grand Tours. He didn't take a huge number of wins for himself. I think the German national title was probably one of the standouts for him, but he was always solid as a rock in his support of other riders. So chapeau to you, Christian. However, he's not completely leaving the sport or indeed his current team, Ineos. He's going to take up a role there as a member of staff, although there are currently no details as to exactly what that role will entail. Right then, that is all for this week's racing news show. I'll be back next week actually with Cy in a pre-recorded racing news show. We'll be looking back at some of the more quirky parts of the cycling season in 2020. And so, all that leaves me to say is a Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Bring it on, I'll see you then. Bye for now.